Welcome to another presentation in the Hope Now Bible Study series. In yesterday's study, we took a close look at God's plan of salvation for humanity and the practical steps on how to receive His salvation. In today's presentation, we are going to discover what Jesus meant when He said, If you love me, keep my commandments. The title of our study is, What Happened to Right and Wrong, God's Everlasting Law. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we submit our will to your will so that we can follow you and obey you. Tonight, O oh God, we are going to study about your Ten Commandments. Thank you for blessing this message. In Jesus' name, amen. There are lots of bad things happening in our world today. The news is constantly reminding us of that. Crime and violence are everywhere. The days are long gone when you can leave home without lo locking your doors or leave your bicycle unchained after riding it to, to the store. The respect of property and life are at in all time law. And the love of many, as the Bible puts it, seems to be growing colder as time goes on. There are many theories on why the world is growing more unstable and unsafe. Some people point to disturbing trends in society, such as the self-centeredness that has increased with the rise of social media and the internet. It is true that those probably have contributed to a faster breakdown of positive traditional values having to do with respect for God, the family, and each other. But I don't think it is possible to blame all of our current woes on social media or the internet. As is often the case, there are probably multiple factors that contribute to the moral decline we are witnessing today. One of those factors that is contributing to the decline may surprise you, and what is that? It's the church. And when we say church, we're talking about Christianity in general. How is it possible that Christianity is contributing to the moral decline in the world today. Because there is great confusion in the church about what is right and what is wrong. There are many churches that teach that God's standard of morality no longer applies. His Ten Commandments, or at least some of the commandments, have been changed or abolished or are no longer relevant, or are impossible to keep. But without external moral guidance, many people are just doing whatever they think is right, and society is reaping a harvest of every kind of evil imaginable. In the words of the prophet Uzziah, they sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. But now we know that what is right. Who gets uh, to make that decision? Why can't we just listen to the wise intellectual people in our communities, or for sure to our priests, pastors, and church administrators to tell us what is correct? As tempted as we may be to, took, uh, to look to other people to tell us what is right or wrong, the Bible says that people are actually not good judges of what is right and what is wrong. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The fact is, our natural hearts don't know what is right and wrong. Sometimes our hearts don't know what the right thing is, since that means we might have to change our actions. In today's world, 
there are lots of people who have YouTube channels, podcasts, blogs, vlogs, and new sites attracting followers from all over the world. Of course, there are some positive social influencers and quite a few negative ones as well, with so many opinions about what is right or wrong. It becomes a challenge to know who or what to believe. And there is great danger when we look to others to find out what is right and wrong, because by doing this, we can easily be led astray. The Apostle Paul talked about the very times we live in when he said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Media influencers, popular priests or pastors, ethical philosophers, and many other voices are all pointing people in different directions today. Many of these influencers say that no rulers are really needed. What's most important is to just follow your heart and discover the truth that is inside of you and that will set you free. The Bible calls that kind of loving lawlessness and lawless living doesn't lead to freedom. It becomes evident pretty quickly what happens when a society throws out the rules? Have you ever driven in a county where traffic signs and signals didn't really exist? A place where people are, in essence, free to drive however they wish? I have, and I have seen it. It's chaos. There is no true freedom when there are no rules. Just as governments have traffic laws to rule, the road so that everyone's journeys are peaceful and safe. God's government has a law to rule the life so that life's journey will be one of peace and safety. And that law in the Bible is known as the Ten Commandments. The story of how God put this law in writing takes place after God led the children of Israel out of Egypt. One important thing to note here it's not that the Ten Commandments didn't exist before God gave the Israelites this law. Actually, His law had been in place since creation. We see evidence of people keeping or breaking those commandments long before they were ever written in stone. It's just that the commandments were given to God's people in a very special way at a place called Mount Sinai after they had been freed from slavery in Egypt. The Lord came down to meet them and said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God identified himself as their deliverer from slavery. He was the one who had opened up the Red Sea before them. He was the one who was leading them to the new land and a new life. He wanted them to trust him and believe that he knew what was best for them. One of the first things God did was to give them rules to live by. If they followed them, obedience would bring such peace and happiness into their lives. These 10 short commandments summarize how God wants us to relate to him and how he wants us to relate to each other. The Ten Commandments really show us what God is like, what his character of love is like, and again, how he wants us to express ourselves to him and to others. Let's take a quick look at the list of Ten Commandments God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Some of the commandments are longer than what we read here, but here is a summary of it. First commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. 
you shall not bow down to them. Third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Eighth commandment, you shall not steal. Ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the tenth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is in your neighbors. To show how important and permanent these are, look at what God did. And when he had made the end speaking of him on Mount Sinai, he gave them the two tables of stones. The two tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Even though this was first time God gave his law in written form to humanity, the principles of this law had obviously existed from all eternity. This eternal unchangeable standard of right and wrong is the basis of God's heavenly government, and why should it not be? It is simply an expression of the character of God, which is unselfish love expressed in living for the good of others. Even angels in heaven were governed by the unselfish principles of God's law. When Satan began to proclaim and accuse God of selfishness and unfairness, all the angels had to decide which side they would be on. Unfortunately, many chose to rebel against God's law of love and instead following Satan's lawless agenda of self first, others second, or not at all. This rebellious movement was based on the attitude of we don't need a law, we will be a law unto ourselves. It was this attitude that turned into open rebellion and caused Satan and those who followed him to be expelled from heaven. We've looked at this passage before in this presentation, but let's read it again. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail nor was in a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to this earth, and his angels were cast out with him. What about the angels who remain loyal to God? The Bible describes them as beings who trust that God's commandments are for their good, so they obey him. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word. We have already studied in a previous presentation what happened after Satan was expelled from heaven. Satan devised a plan to get the first human couple to sin, to disobey God's commands. Even though it wasn't written on tablets of stone yet, we know that God's law existed from the beginning of human existence. How do we know this? Because the Apostle Paul points out this logical fact that where there is no law, there is no transgression. Without a law to break, Adam and Eve would not have been guilty of sin. Abraham knew and obeyed the law of God long before the law was spoken on Sinai. God said he would bless Abraham and his descendants because Abraham obeyed my voice 
and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Long before Sinai, Joseph's sensitive conscience led him to meet the temptation of Potiphar's wife, saying, There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph knew adultery was sin. He knew God's standard of right and wrong, and he firmly determined not to sin against God by disobeying the seventh commandment. And one of the most interesting references to the Ten Commandments before Sinai took place in the Israelite camp while they were in the desert. After the Exodus, just a few weeks before they reached Sinai, the Lord rebuked Moses because the Israelites were breaking his law by attempting to gather manna on the Sabbath. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? So the people resisted on the seventh day. Here we see the fourth commandment was also well known before Sinai. I want to repeat and emphasize something here. Just as earthly governments have laws to create a safe, happy, and harmonious society, so God's law is meant to bring peace and happiness to his creation. The law was never intended to be a burden or given as some kind of punishment to restrict the happiness of humanity. As was mentioned earlier, it is a law that reveals to us God's character of love, a sin through how he asks us to relate to him and to others. God asks us to obey his commandments as a way to show our love and trust in him. In the New Testament, Jesus made this very clear to his followers. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. At another time, Jesus revealed the two great principles behind God's Ten Commandments and all of his laws. Jesus quoted from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus when he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And it's exactly how the Ten Commandments are structured. Have you ever noticed this? When we truly love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, we will express that love by keeping the first four commandments. God will be number one in our lives. Our worship will be reserved for Him alone. He, we will respect and reverence His holy name. And we will set aside the seventh day Sabbath each week to spend with Him. And when we really love others as we love ourselves, we will express that love by keeping the last six commandments. We will respect and honor our parents, value life, preserve sexual morality, respect the property rights of others, be honest in our dealings and relationships, and not covet that which belongs to others. When we do these things, will our lives be the richer and better for it? Guaranteed, the Ten Commandments are not a fence to keep happiness out. No way, no way. They are a wall of protection intended to shield us from the pain and sorrow and guilt that selfish living causes. God intended that His law would secure, would ensure everyone's freedom and safety as we live life in communion with Him and with one another. I love how God expressed this concept here in Deuteronomy. He said, Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me 
and always keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their children forever. That's how compassionate and loving God is. You see, just as engineers build guardrails on bridges and mountain roads to protect us from danger, God gave us his law to protect and guard us on the road of life. There is another important reason why the law was given, and that is stated here in Romans. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. A little later in the same book, Paul wrote, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Let me illustrate it this way. The story is told of a princess who had been led to believe by her subjects that her beauty was unsurpassed. However, one day, a trader came to her village and sold her a mirror. When she looked into the mirror, she was horrified by her appearance and smashed the mirror in pieces. God's law is like a mirror. As we look into it, like the princess, we may not be pleased with what we see, but trying to destroy the law or ignoring it won't change our condition. While the law can show us the problem, it is not the solution. The law cannot give power to overcome sin or remove our guilt. The law cannot give life. It was never designed to do that. God's law points out our sinful condition for one very important reason, and that is to show our need for a Savior. It is the Savior who gives life and not the law. The Apostle Paul said it in this way, If there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But righteousness is not from the law. Righteousness comes only through Jesus. If the law could save us, Christ didn't need to die. But listen carefully. If God's law was not important, God could have just changed it or done away with it, and humanity's guilt would have been excused. By God's law, but God's law is very important because it shows us our condition and our need for Christ's righteousness to cover us since we do not have any of our own. So no, unlike what some priests and pastors are teaching today, Jesus' death on Calvary did not do away with the Ten Commandments. The only way we know what sin is is through the law. Sin is defined as the transgression of the law. So here's the question. Is there sin in the world today? Is, a sin, is it sin to commit adultery? Is it a sin to steal, murder, or dishonor your parents? I hope you answered yes. If there is sin then there is still a law. There is another reason why Jesus could not have abolished the Ten Commandments at the cross. And you know why? As we have already stated, if there is no law, then there is no sin today. Because sin is a transgression of the law. But it goes farther than that. If there is no sin, then there is no need for grace since grace is God's mercy to us when we have broken his law. If there is no grace, then there was no need for the cross, because we aren't really sinners. If there is no need for the cross, we don't need a Savior. Let's say this again in one sentence. If you do away with the law, you also do away with sin, and the need for grace, the cross, and a Savior. Again, this point is being made because so many churches have tried to change God's law or do away with it completely, saying that Jesus abolished the Ten Commandments by his death on the cross. 
but this is not but this is simply not true there were other laws and ceremonies having to do with the sacrifice of lambs and sanctuary service that stopped at the cross but not God's moral law God's moral law didn't change or disappear God could not change his law nor ignore sin so when the Son of God died to pay the penalty for the broken law, that very act established the fact that God's law is unchangeable and eternal. His law was in place in creation of humanity, and it will play a central role in the future judgment of humanity. King Solomon is one of the first Bible writers who gives us indication that the Ten Commandments will be God's standard of what is right and wrong during the judgment in the last days. Solomon said, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for the, this is man's all, for God will bring every work into judgment. This is why the Apostle James says, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Which law is James talking about? In the previous verse, verse 11, James mentioned two of the commandments, do not commit adultery and do not kill. So obviously, God's Ten Commandments law is the law of liberty that we still be in effect and use during the last judgment. So how will the law be used in this judgment? This is not difficult to understand. Remember what Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Those who are saved are those who show their love for Jesus through obedience. It is by keeping his commandments that we show that we love and trust him. We keep his commandments because we are saved, not in order to be saved. There is a big difference between these two ways of looking at the commandments. It is very important to understand the difference between the two. That is why we have been looking at this next verse so often. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There is nothing we can ever do to add to Christ's amazing sacrifice for us. Our obedience does not make us worthy of salvation. Our works can never do that. Our obedience is a response of love, a response to the incredible, undeserving gift that has been given to us. It is understandable that some people could become confused in this discussion of law and grace. I've heard people say, since I am not saved by works, it doesn't really matter what I do then, right? What's the big deal? If I sin when I want to, God will just forgive me and give me more grace, right? These kinds of questions are not new. There were people saying this all the way back in the Apostle Paul's day as well. Look how Paul responds to this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? The Bible says that those who receive salvation want their hearts to be changed, to be more like Jesus to do his will and to live in harmony with his law. They don't want to continue living in disobedience to God's commandments. They desire freedom from a life chained to their habits of sin. They don't want to live in sin any longer. It's like this. Suppose a man is in prison for committing a terrible crime. If he receives a pardon and is set free, does that mean that he is then free to go out and go and do that crime once again? No. When people are pardoned, they aren't free to go continue their crimes. 
and most of them don't want to. When they are pardoned, they want to live changed lives and obey the law because they were pardoned. When we accept pardon from Christ, he not only provides forgiveness, but also the power to keep his commandments. God says, I will put my laws in their heart and in their minds and write them on their hearts. That is something God promises to do in you. Will you let him do that in your heart today? I hope so. Because the book of Revelation talks about the last group of faithful people on earth right before Jesus comes. The prophecy says that there were, will be a group who will be keeping God's commandments during the last days of earth's history. Those who are ready to meet Jesus at his second coming are described in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I wish we had time in this series to look in detail at some of these prophecies of Revelation that explain how Satan will do everything possible right before Jesus comes to break the faith of God's people and get them to willfully disobey God's law. He will use deception persecution, and government legislation to attack God's people. In one of the prophecies, it says that Satan becomes enraged at God's faithful followers and especially targets those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Do you want to be a part of that faithful group, my friend? You can be. Is it a struggle when God asks you to give up your sinful habits that go against his law? Yes, of course. Yes, that is so very much. Our sinful natures are attracted to sinful things. The battle is real. It is not easy surrendering our will to God and giving up our desires. Jesus knows this, and he knows it by experience. With drops of blood trickling down his face from the weight of sin, the Son of Man prayed, O oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. On that night long ago, the fate of the human race hung in a balance. There was a guilty world to be saved or lost by one decision. Would the Son of God put all desire for life and human fulfillment aside and give his life for a planet of rebels? He could so easily wipe the sweat from his brow and say, let them get what they deserve. Let them all suffer the consequences of their own sins. At that moment, Jesus had a choice to make. He could go back to heaven or he could go to the cross. He chose the cross. He chose you. He chose me and every child of humanity. He chose to give us life. If you have not already, my friend, won't you take it? Won't you reach out and take the tree and the free gift of life that he extends to you right now? Are you willing to let him write his law on your heart? Are you willing to make a decision today to keep his commandments, not to gain his favor or earn salvation, but out of a response of love to him for all that he has done for you? If you are willing, he is more than willing to give us life. Write his law on your heart and give you the strength to obey his commands. If you desire for him to do these things for you and in you, Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening. We come to you, Lord, with burdens in our hearts and await the load of sin that are in us. And we don't have the power to overcome and we don't have the power of God to make a choice. And so we pray that uh, 
you will come into our hearts and give us that will to change and give us that will to obey your law and give us, O oh Lord, your grace so that we can continue to face you, O oh God, and receive blessings from you. O oh Lord, there are some today who are, O oh Lord, is struggling with sin. We pray that you will help them, take them up, O oh God, from the quagmire of sin. And thank you so much for touching their hearts and be softened so that they will continue to submit and surrender to you. Ask for forgiveness because it is readily given by you for those repentant, those who would ask for forgiveness, and you are readily able to forgive. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us for our live panel discussion on today's topic. Please invite a friend to join you for tomorrow's presentation entitled, Created for Something Better. Now may the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless.